Hello everyone, and thank you for joining me today on our podcast on the subject of women's rights relating to the workplace. I hope you can all gain something useful from this presentation, which we will get into now. Women's rights, a subject that has long been overlooked and disregarded in both the workplace setting and in everyday life. In order to analyze any problems present in the workplace today, we must first look back at Canada's historical struggles with women's rights and how we got to where we are now. Issues present in women's rights and equality dates back further than a specific date can state. But the first large step towards a fix in Canada occurred in 1872, when Mount Allison University in New Brunswick became the first to accept women into their programs. Before this, it was unheard of in Canada for women to receive such high degrees. Soon after this, in 1876, Dr. Emily Stowe, one of the first female doctors in Canada, started the Women's Literacy Club, This club was started at a time where women's literacy was not a priority in society, as it was seen that women activities occurred within the confinements of a house. Both of these examples offered women the opportunity to educate themselves, an opportunity scarcely available at this time in history. Then came World War I, the time of great change for women. At this time, while men were away at war, women took on responsibilities they would have never been traditionally assigned. Suddenly, women could be found in factories manufacturing weapons, agricultural fields to ensure soldiers were fed, and some were even looking out at the battlefield as nurses. After World War I ended, many women weren't okay with presuming their regular positions and fought to enact societal change. From this point on, achievements towards women's rights stacked up and happened rapidly. Today's basic right of all Canadian citizens, voting, was granted to women first in Manitoba, followed by Saskatchewan, back in 1916. At this point, women weren't legally considered as persons in Canada, as that achievement would come 13 years later in 1929. By this year, only one province, Quebec, and one territory, the Northwest Territories, prevented women from voting. Then came World War II, where women went back to their roles from the First World War. This gave another huge push and priority to the subject of women's rights. Following World War II in 1940, Quebec extended voting rights to women, followed by the Northwest Territories in 1951. In 1960, Canada ensured Indigenous women's voting rights were granted through amending Canada's Elections Act. Furthermore, in 1977, the Canadian Human Rights Act was established, which ensured freedom from discrimination in employment for all, including women. Of course, this did not fully solve anything, as workplaces still opted to discriminate on the basis of gender. 1981 brought another huge step towards women's rights as the topic was finalized in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which can be found in Section 28, stating all rights and freedoms found in the Charter apply equally to males and females. However, we can't talk about women's rights without commenting on the important female figures who shaped the views we hold today. Back in 1915, the Political Equality League petition gained over 40,000 signatures from women across Canada for women's rights to vote. This called No Scream for Change in Our Society. Another feminist wave was in the 1960s to 70s, where talk and protests for women's rights started popping up left and right by ladies deemed suffragettes. One notable example being the abortion car van to Ottawa in 1970, fighting for women's right to abortion. From then on, we got the first Canadian female astronaut in space, Roberta Bondar, 1992, and the first female Prime Minister, Kim Campbell, 1993. So with all this change and all these outcries, how far have we come? In recent years, at least legally since the Human Rights Act was created, women have had equal opportunity in the workplace. When women apply for a job, it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of gender. So where did this great idea, equal opportunity, turn into a supposed need for equal outcome in Canada? First, let's review the difference between these two terms. Equal opportunity is when everyone, regardless of arbitrary characteristics, has the same opportunity to complete the same job as others. Equal outcome, on the other hand, is when the outcome of said job is monitored to be equal. That means that even if 50 men and 25 women were to apply to the same position, 5 would have to be male and 5 would have to be female. This directly goes against meritocracy and is discrimination based on gender, as qualified people lose the position due solely to their gender, whether that be male or female. An example of this in use in Canada is Trudeau's Gender Balanced Cabinet established back in 2015, with 15 females and 16 males, including Trudeau. This is a forced result and likely does not reflect who is most qualified for said position, whether that be male or female. Although all are probably qualified, the importance of getting the most qualified is important, especially in something as high up as government. To place an arbitrary limitation on the amount of people who can and cannot be hired is, by definition, hiring based on something that does not necessarily affect job performance, which is discrimination. 
So now, onto the common question of the glass ceiling. If equal opportunity exists, what's going on there? For one, there are women CEOs. In fact, 74 of the 500 CEOs on Forbes are women, roughly 15%. If it really was a ceiling, which would mean a defined limitation applying to all women, there would be no women CEOs. The disparity here is caused by biological factors such as agreeableness, as women, on average, are more agreeable than their male counterparts. If a female is the most qualified for a job, possessing all necessary prerequisites, there should be no reason for them not to be chosen. Now obviously, there are private companies that will be discriminatory, and that is a major issue that ultimately affects their company as they aren't selecting the best candidate. If they are proven to be discriminatory based solely on gender, again, that is illegal. Due to this idea of necessary equality to combat a disparity related to biological traits, we have gone past the sweet spot of equal opportunity and shifted into something far more harmful, equal outcome. So hear me, business professionals, we understand the struggle of past women, and we understand the need for equal opportunity, but under no circumstance should gender be the sole qualifying factor of hiring, whether it be through outright discrimination or discrimination through quotas. This leads us right back into the early 1900s, where people are judged based on something as arbitrary as gender. Thank you for listening, and I will now be going over questions submitted by some of our subscribers. Starting off with Gwyneth from the UK, who asks, What about companies that would just use this to hire males? Wouldn't that go directly against women's rights? Now that is a great question, and that is why we have the Human Rights Act. It's still illegal to hire people who aren't qualified over those who are based on arbitrary characteristics like gender, so in your example, if a company were hiring solely males over qualified females, that could definitely still lead to a lawsuit. And our second question for today was submitted by Charles from BC. He questions, what do you mean by biological differences between males and females? Why would that affect hiring and promotion at high-up positions? Well, again, that is a great question. The answer is that females, on average, score higher in agreeableness, and men, on average, score higher in assertiveness and willingness to take risk. So while in regular life, the slight difference here is not really shown, it is highlighted in high-up CEO positions, where willingness to take risk and assertiveness are very important characteristics. Alright, so to take away from this, for future recommendations, I want to see your companies hiring based on meritocracy. Gender should not be a factor for who you are hiring or promoting, as it is not a determining factor for who will succeed. Let us steer away from judging people based on characteristics that do not affect the quality of their work, and instead judge individuals based on a criteria that truly does apply to their position. Thank you once again.